Good afternoon. I'm Joyce Barrett, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Webinars are brought to you by the generosity of the supporters and members of Heritage Ohio. Heritage Ohio's mission is to help people save the places that matter, build community, live better. Today, we have a presentation on embracing winter, how Edmonton changed their culture. I'm so pleased to have Isla Tanaka with us from Edmonton, where they've been working for seven years to activate their community during the winter. It can be done. The PowerPoint is attached as a handout in the box in your little right-hand panel where it has handouts. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but if you have a question, feel free to type it into the question box at any time. If you have any issues with the webinar software, it's usually solved if you sign out and restart with the link that was sent to you. Our speaker today is Isla Tanaka. She's the winter planner for the city of Edmonton. She holds a master's of natural resource and environmental studies degree where she explored outdoor recreation spaces in winter cities. She's presented on winter life and design in North America, Asia, and Europe, and helped plan two international winter city conferences. Isla sits on the International Board of the Winter Cycling Federation. She's raised two children in Northern Canada, Canadian communities, cycles year-round, and loves cross-country ski gator, skiing gator. You'll have to tell us about that. For all of you later this afternoon, go to webinar. We'll send out the link to this recording if you want to share or, or watch it again. With that, I'm ready to hand the presentation over to Isla. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Joyce. So thank you for having me. Um, as Joyce mentioned, I'm here to share with you what Edmonton has done to embrace being a winter city and hopefully give you some ideas of what you can do in your cities, especially this winter, with COVID forcing us to socially distance and spend more time outside. So a few years ago, when we started, headlines like this were very common. How to survive the Edmonton winter, a guide for frigid newbies and frosty vets. And even Maclean's magazine, which is one of our um, large national magazines, called us a nation of winter wusses. And so this is where we started. We saw our northernness as a liability. Winter was something to be endured. Edmontonians were hibernating. We were staying indoors. Uh, the businesses and public sector even had difficulty recruiting people to come to Edmonton. It was fairly easy in the summer, but not in the winter. People were afraid of our winters. Um, and we do know that winter comes with more challenges, dealing with cold and ice and snow. And for us, longer hours of darkness, uh, you know, can be a challenge. But we weren't always like this. You know, over 100 years ago, we were skating on ponds. We were skiing in our river valley. We had our first um, annual winter carnival in 1923. And even that picture in the middle is women's hockey in Edmonton in 1910. But at some point, we learned to hibernate. We escaped winter, we closed our parts, and we stayed inside. So what we're doing now is focusing again on winter and learning to embrace it. And when we started, we knew that we were pretty good at winter festivals. Um, we had a number of them going at that time, uh, but what we really wanted to do was focus on everyday life, changing those day-to-day -day experiences. So we used the systems thinking model, which is much like an iceberg, and we didn't want to just focus on those events and festivals that are visible at the top. That's what the public sees. They see winter events, they see winter festivals. But we wanted to dig deeper than that. We wanted to look at our bylaws, how we allocated our budgets, our maintenance and operations, and our design and infrastructure. And we wanted to go even deeper down into those stories we tell ourselves about what it's like to live in Edmonton in winter. We used to talk about winter as being the off season and we apologized for it a lot. And we said it was minus 30 for six months of the year. And it really isn't. So what we were really talking about was a cultural shift. So we did like all municipalities have to do, we held consultations, but we didn't just go to the public, it was multifaceted. So we talked to post-secondary education leaders. We even talked to meteorologists because let's face it, they're the people that most residents hear first thing in the morning. They say what the weather is, and that will set people up for the day. So how you deliver that message can have a huge impact. 
if you say, oh, it's, and I'm talking Celsius here, but if you say, oh, it's minus 20 outside, you know, stay warm today, or you say it's minus 20, the sun is shining, make sure you bundle up and get out there. It's a completely different message and sets people up with a different mindset. So we also talk to the tourism industry, we talk to social services agencies um, that deal with our indigenous populations and with our newcomers, we talk to urban designers, our chamber of commerce. So like I said, it was very multifaceted and very broad. But when we talk to the public, we asked them what would help them fall in love with winter in Edmonton. So we really evoked emotion. Uh, we asked them to focus on the assets. What did our winters already have going for them? How could we amplify that? And we really didn't realize it at the time, but just having those conversations was starting that cultural shift that we wanted to have. You know, it's, it's interesting when we spoke to most people about their favorite winter memory, it was usually from their childhood. Children love to play in the snow. They can play outside for hours. But as adults, we tend to forget. We stop moving when we're outside, so we get cold. We watch the kids play, but we also tend not to dress properly. So it was really interesting to remind people how much fun they could have um, outside. And so all of those ideas that we gathered from the public and from the various groups we talked to were given to a community-led task force. So this task force was made up entirely of community members who were supported by city staff. And at the, uh, before they reviewed all of the ideas, they came up with recurring themes and guiding principles. And so any idea that was chosen to go into the strategy had to be driven by the people. It had to come from community. And then it had to be authentic, meaning it had to work for Edmonton. You know, we saw some great ideas, for example, from Helsinki, or from us, some other winter cities in Canada. But the idea had to work for us. Because let's face it, there are lots of winter cities around the world, but our winters are very different. We get very cold being in the middle of the prairies, but Montreal gets huge amounts of snow. So what we can do differs from what they can do. And the, the ideas had to be attitude changing and they had to be sustainable. So when we were talking about sustainable, it was partly in the environmental sense, that was definitely in our minds, but we were talking multi-generational. We didn't want this to just be a strategy that lasted for a few years, and that was fun, and then everybody learned to hibernate again. So we really wanted this to be very long term and very much a cultural shift. And our city councillor, who um, actually whose idea it was in the first place, but he's been with us the whole, the whole, um, every step of the way. He said, "Don't get bogged down with the way that we do things now. Our current regulations, or our process, and operations, and our budgets, we can change those. You know, think big." You know there are there are no boundaries and so all of those ideas were gathered like i said the the community-led task force looked at them all and created what we call for the love of winter and this is our vision document and our strategy so it's divided into four pillars winter life winter design winter economy and our winter story and i'll tell you about some actions in each one of them but each pillar has a working group that is made up of community members and city staff. So we, it's still, this strategy is still very much grounded in community. What we did was we, those working groups had a look at the vision document and we reviewed every action that was in there. And we, we tested them for feasibility, we set budgets, we identified partners, and we laid out a 10 year roadmap. So our implementation plan was adopted by council in 2013, and that's what we've been working on ever since. So as you can see, we ended up with 64 actions over those four pillars. But again, you know, still not doing it alone. Community still involved, groups are still involved. Um, and I'm just going to wait for the slide to go. There we go. So winter life, um, the, the winter life pillar focuses on people. And the actions here focus on providing more opportunities for outdoor activities and active transportation. So some of the winter life actions we've completed include working with coworkers to improve winter recreation in our parks. We've created two new skating trails in two of our River Valley parks. We've increased snow clearing in some of them. 
And that's not just the trails. We now clear spaces up to our picnic tables. Many of our picnic tables were taken out in the winter time. We now leave a lot of them, and some of them can actually be booked, which we couldn't do um, beforehand. So we we clear paths up to the picnic tables. We tend to clear them off, but when we encourage residents to use them, we still say you might need to take a shovel in case it snowed overnight and you have to clear off the table. Um, but that has been a big change for us is encouraging people to just get out and use our parks more in the winter. We partnered with another initiative in the city called Child Friendly uh, to create a winter play street. The play streets have become popular around the world and we decided to hold one downtown in winter. Uh, we have a number of children who live downtown. They tend to be underserved with play areas. So we closed off a block and we had a winter play street and it was a lot of fun. And we also provide grants to local ski hills to provide ski and snowboard opportunities for newcomers and for youth from low-income families. And the winter design pillar focuses on changing the way we design our city. Edmonton has been built like many southern North American cities and we haven't designed for our northern context and that's what we're aiming to change with this pillar. So the foundational action in this one was creating winter design guidelines for our city. And this was about a two and a half year project and we worked with local city planners, designers, architects, landscape architects, builders, community developers, and of course, with, uh, city staff. And these design guidelines really focus on the pedestrian experience. So they're divided into two sections, uh, the streetscape, to create streets that are more vibrant and attractive for people in all seasons, so that we can have places um, like this to be. Now, not all of Edmonton looks like this, but we do have some areas. Um, and they're much more comfortable than big, wide, open, windy spaces in the wintertime. And then the second section of the design guidelines is the open spaces. So that's our parks and our um, plazas and our squares. And so these are our public spaces and we want them to be able to support outdoor winter programming and recreation and, and everyday winter life. So that we can have spaces like this. This one um, I'm just waiting for the slide to advance and it'll go in a minute. So it's a space that's outside our city hall. It's a fountain in the, in the summertime and it's a skating rink in the winter. So it's a really good example of four season design. Another thing we're working on in the design pillar is uh, lighting guidelines for our city. Lighting can be used to highlight architectural features um, like this building. But this is also dark sky compliant lighting. It's not actually in Edmonton, it's in Jasper, um, a town in the Rocky Mountains. And that town is actually working um, to become a dark sky compliant community because they want to be able to see the stars again. So it's, it's much more difficult in a large city, but we can still reduce the amount of light pollution we have. Um, so we can have uh, lighting like this, you know, architectural lighting that still creates safe pedestrian areas. Um, or we can have creative lighting like this one. This is one of the skating trails we created in our parks. We had a local artist create uh, lanterns that we've hung in the trees, and it was a really created a really magical experience. Another thing we're working to change is, <clears throat> excuse me, the way we design to reduce wind at the ground level. We used to have an airport in downtown Edmonton, and it's been closed. So the height envelope or the height restrictions on our buildings have been have been removed. So we're starting to see a lot of tall towers um, in our downtown. And tall towers, as most of you probably know, can create very windy conditions at the street level. So we're working to understand how we can mitigate some of those downdraft effects. So on the right, you can see that there's a podium on part of that building and you can see the snow swirling around on the top of the podium. So it's much more comfortable for the pedestrians walking along that side of the building. But you can also see that podium doesn't extend around the other side. And a lot of our city staff normally work in this building. <laughs> um, not right now with COVID, we're all at home. But I can tell you that that side without the podium is much windier and much more unpleasant on a cold winter day. Um, so how we build our tall buildings can make a big difference to the pedestrian experience. Now the winter economy pillar has three goals. To support our local festivals, 
develop a four season patio culture and support winter businesses. So we support our festivals by managing some equipment that they can all use. Things like fire pits and heaters and tents that are winter rated. They can't just use tents that are used in the summertime. They have to be rated down to about minus 30 or minus 40 degrees. Now that's Celsius, but when you get down that low, it's pretty close to Fahrenheit. Um, and there's also some lighting equipment uh, that's shared in that inventory. And we also help them with marketing and promotions. We also worked with our tourism office to promote Edmonton as a winter destination. They didn't use to promote Edmonton in the winter um, as a winter place. It was a lot of um, indoor things like our theater and you might have heard of West Edmonton Mall. It's a huge mall we have here. Uh, but they weren't promoting outdoor activities. So we worked with them and this is from their very first winter campaign. It's fun and it's cheeky um, and actually they won awards for it. And we're now seeing tourists coming to Edmonton in the winter for a winter experience. And we heard from residents when we were developing the strategy and we're still hearing it, that they would like a European style winter market. The challenge we've had is keeping the vendors warm. <clears throat> I mean, we can be a lot colder than some of those European cities with the Christmas markets. So the, the temperatures for us have been a challenge. These are the market huts we piloted first. We've now tried a second design, uh, but we're still struggling with keeping the vendors warm, particularly if the market is open for several hours on one day. But you know, we're still working on it. And when we do hold them, people come out, they're very interested. A very positive story that we've heard um, in the economy pillar is actually from local bike shops. Winter cycling is growing in Edmonton, in part because we have a fairly new uh, separated bike network um, in a couple of areas in our city. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that, the, that winter is the argument for separated bike lanes. You can keep them clear and it keeps the pedestrians away from the vehicles. Drivers don't have to worry about them. Um, and if you have safe infrastructure, people will ride their bikes. It's not the cold that stops them, it's the perception of safety. Um, so anyway, winter cycling is growing and one of our local bike shops told us that they used to have to lay off half of their staff in the winter time and now they're keeping all of their staff year round. So a Saturday in the shop can be just as busy in winter as a Saturday in the summer. So that's a really good news story, but our local businesses are also seeing a difference. So cyclists and pedestrians tend to stop more often than people who are driving a vehicle. So drivers go from A to B. If something catches the eye of a pedestrian or a cyclist, they tend to stop. So our coffee shops that are on our new bike network have actually seen an increase uh, in business. So that's a really good story, um, one that we like to share, because it's not, it's, it's about active transportation. It shows how holistic this strategy is. It's about winter life. It's about active transportation, about getting people outside. It's, it's our economy. It's also design. If you have the right type of infrastructure, people will use it. Um, and then it's also changing our story. People aren't afraid of riding bikes in the winter as much as they used to be. Um, so it's, this is quite a unique story. And then our winter story, that's the last pillar. Um, the actions in this pillar focus on the cultural shift, you know, how we're embracing and celebrating our winter season. So one of the things we've done is create a program to encourage residents to decorate their front yards in winter. We call it Winterscapes. And these are just a couple of entries we've seen, and I have a few more for you later on. We also celebrate and promote the winter culture and stories of our local indigenous people. Um, they're um, they tend to, um, the, the festivals um, are very inclusive and uh, this is from one of, our, one of our festivals down in the River Valley. And another thing we do is we promote and promote and promote. Um, when we developed the Winter City Strategy, the city of Oslo in Norway told us that people forget how to deal with winter and they need to be reminded every year that winter can be fun. And so over the last seven years, we've developed quite a robust suite of social media platforms. Um, 
and we have an external website so that's the one listed at the top and on there we have three toolkits uh, be active be creative and be social and it's all kinds of ideas for um, to help people get outside and how to decorate their houses and you know what kinds of uh, food you can cook over an open fire and um, you know it's just it's a lot of fun um, fun things in those toolkits so I encourage you to have a look at them uh, we also for the last uh, six years have produced the winter excitement guide we don't have one for this winter uh, because of COVID um, and and actually our social media has been paused for now because we've gone into a fairly we're not in total lockdown but we're in fairly strict restrictions right now so uh, city messaging is is all about COVID messaging at the moment. Um, so if you check out the the social media platforms, you'll see they haven't been active. Uh, but we're we're hoping to help um, promote how people can be active outside. Um, so we're working with our communications and engagement team. And the other thing on that website is a podcast. We started one last winter. We have three episodes that are up. Uh, they were fun to do, and if you listen to them, I really hope you enjoy them. Uh, we have a, uh, two or three more that are ready to go, um, but again, because of COVID, they have been paused, um, but we do have them. So what does all of this mean for a COVID winter? So when I talked about the design guidelines earlier, basically design and infrastructure are the bedrock for supporting outdoor winter life. So when you're looking to encourage people to be out this winter, um, I'm hoping to give you some ideas that will help you choose the right spaces um, that will that will be more inviting for people. So as I said, those design guidelines that we created are for Edmonton and for our context, but there are some basic winter city design principles that are universal. So blocking wind, capturing sunshine, using color and creative lighting and infrastructure. So this is what they can look like when used all together in one space, like in a plaza or a square, for example. You know, you'd want it to be sheltered from the wind, have some afternoon sunshine, have the you know right type of infrastructure that supports people being outside in the winter, lighting for when it gets dark, um, and some color. But if you can only focus on two, focus on blocking wind and capturing sunshine. These two together can create a much more comfortable microclimate. And if, if you can only do one and not the other, you might still get an uncomfortable space. So if you can find spaces that are blocked from the wind and capture that afternoon sunshine, it can feel, now this is Celsius, it can feel 10 to 15 degrees Celsius warmer than the surrounding area. So for those of you uh, who deal with Fahrenheit, it means that 14 degrees Fahrenheit can feel like 41 degrees which is a significant difference when you have people spending time outside in the wintertime. Use some color, add some touches. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of color. Add some paint to some things, um, even natural wood like in the gazebo, you know, creates, it's visually, it's warm. Uh, add some colorful benches. Keep your lawn grasses in your parks, but just add some, some visual interest, even uh, planters, put some planters out with some greenery in them, and right there it changes people's mindsets and how it, how warm they feel. And then be strategic with lighting. So again, this here's this picture from Jasper, but the top one is also dark sky compliant. So you want to keep that light down. What we've heard from international lighting designers is you need to have contrast. If you try to recreate daylight, the lighting becomes ineffective. And, in, and sometimes it even creates a space that feels more unsafe because if you're going from a really bright area, your eyes are used to the being really bright and you step out of that, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust into a darker space and you can't see. If you're in that bright space, you can't see what's in that dark space. So you don't have to recreate that daylight. So be really strategic with it, but also be creative with it. And it doesn't have to be permanent, it can be temporary fixtures. All of these on this slide are temporary. So the top one is just lanterns hung in trees in one of our parks for one of our festivals. The bottom, again, is that skating trail I showed you earlier. But then on the right-hand side is another way of thinking about lighting. 
if we think historically about our nighttime lighting, it's campfires, which are low, they're on the ground. But we tend to hang lights up high um, because there's this idea that the light has to come from up high because we're trying to recreate daylight. You're not trying to recreate daylight at night. And in the wintertime, the light will reflect off the snow and actually um, be brighter than you think it will be. So along the, you know, can you light along the trail, um, you know, along the ground? It's another option to look at. Unfortunately, you know, people can be destructive at times, so you may not be able to do that. But think outside the box when you're thinking about lighting and, and see how you can do it in a very creative way. The other thing you want to do <clears throat> to me to encourage people to get outside is create an invitation. There will always be people who don't want to be outside in winter and you will never convince them to sit on a winter patio. But there are lots of people who sit on the fence. So if you create an invitation, they will, you know, they will often try it out. Um, so where you place your chairs, where you place your fire pits is really important. Have a look at that space and see what you can do to encourage them to be there. And then you want to provide the right type of infrastructure. And again, like lighting, this can be permanent or it can be temporary. So the top two on this slide are permanent. We have um, the top left is a refrigerated skating trail. So we can start skating earlier in the fall and later into the spring. Um, we also have on the right hand side, a fire pit in one of our parks that's natural gas fed and it has a, a fixed uh, grating on it so that we don't have to have staff monitor that. Um, so it can be just, it can be turned on by staff in the morning and it's left running all day. Um, and then the bottom two are temporary. You know, if you have golf courses and people start snowshoeing or cross country skiing in those spaces in the winter time, if you can, groom trails. If you can't, just let people use them. Um, but you might need to put uh, just a temporary ski rack so they can put their skis somewhere while they're changing their boots. And then the other one, the bottom right, is a portable warming hut that we tried in some of our parks and they were they were very successful. They were like little greenhouses. They got really warm inside. So again, with temporary things, you can move them around to spaces where they're needed. You know, and if needs change, you can just shift them. Another thing to do is to lend program equipment particularly right now where people are starting to think differently, they want to try something, they might not want to invest in the right equipment. So if you have snowshoes that are available for people to try, that's one way to, to get people out. If they're learning to skate, have some skate aids at the rink. Uh, the bottom left is called a kick sled. They're very popular uh, in Scandinavia. And then fire pits are a great place um, for people to gather. Now with COVID, we don't necessarily want people gathering, um, but you know, if you can limit the number of people around a fire pit, just having that fire pit there is a, is a great way to, to help people warm up. And when you're thinking about offering programming, you want to think about all ages, not just children. Children will play in the snow. You want to target adults, um, you know, with cross country lessons or uh, snowshoes. So don't just think about children um, or families, think about all ages. Um, on the bottom right, we used to give out hot chocolate at some of our toboggan hills. Unfortunately, this winter we can't, uh, but depending on your health authorities' rules in your communities and your COVID numbers, maybe that's something that you can offer um, this winter. And you may need to increase maintenance. Um, paths like this can be an immediate barrier for some people. So have a look around, and it's also a very easy one. If you don't normally plow the paths in your in your parks, just plow them and let people know that they're clear, and um, you know it's a great place for them to walk. So I encourage you to think. I have some questions for you to think about. So what's already happening in your city? You know, if people are already building snowmen, hold a yard decorating contest like our winterscapes one. Um, this is another example of what we've of what we've seen, and I'll give you a few more. Has some more ice and lights, um, like uh, the previous slide. This one is is snow, and then they've painted it. Uh, the next one, Easter Island heads, and they added lights in the eyes for nighttime. So you know it can be a lot of fun. 
And another question to ask yourselves are what barriers exist to creating a vibrant outdoor life in winter? What policies and procedures were designed with a summer biased mindset? So when we first started, we realized that our patio permits were only for the summertime. They had to be down by October. So why not extend the patio season, make it year round? Um, are heaters allowed on your sidewalk patios? Are fire pits allowed in public spaces? Have a look. Um, you know, when we hosted this winter market that's in the picture here, we realized that our policies on risk management and alcohol regulations were actually barriers to hosting a, a market like European ones. We couldn't, people couldn't buy a mulled wine or a beer and walk around the market. They had to stay in a fenced off area. So making changes like that takes time and building relationships. But COVID has presented us with a really interesting and unique opportunity to try new things. So have a look, um, like I said, have a look at what, what barriers do you have in your community and what can you do to help break those down this winter? And are you using your streets? <clears throat> Excuse me, we saw around the world this summer, we saw streets being closed to vehicles, open to people, giving them places to walk. But just because it's winter doesn't mean you have to close them to people. Unfortunately, in Edmonton, we have closed some of those um, to people. Uh, but we're in, like I said, uh, we have some pretty strict restrictions right now. We're limited to 10 people outside um, for an outside gathering. Uh, but, you know, when things start to open up again, I'm really hoping we can open some of our streets again and just give people more room to be outside. You may need to provide more warming stations than you did in the summer, uh, just or some benches for people to sit on. Um, and then the, you know, the, the play street um, was, was actually this. So yeah, these are pictures from that play street again, but it's not just about daytime. It's also about, are you playing at night? And we get dark by about 3.30 or 4 in the darkest part of winter. And we tend to keep our kids inside once it's dark. But why not let them outside? Um, you know, if it's dark by 3.30, that's a long time for kids to be inside. So this, is, this picture is also from that play street. We had some fun lighting pieces and fire pits. And, you know, kids stayed outside until about 6 or 7 when we closed it. And, and they just got to play in the dark and they thought it was, it was great. And are you embracing temporary events? Not everything has to be permanent. You don't have to create something that's going to work for the rest of winter. Think about something for one or two weekends. Have a look in your community, see what other events are maybe going on. Can you support other events instead of trying to recreate something new? And then back to the promotion, promote what's happening. Let people know what's going on and where they can go and what they can do. Um, I, I didn't mention earlier, but the other thing we found with promotions is we had a very small library of winter photos um, at the city when we first started. So we've actually invested in professional photos of Edmontonians doing activities in Edmonton. And so when we, when we have ads like this, um, we have local Edmontonians. These are actually, we have unashamedly used coworkers and family members for all of our photos. Um, so these are actually two of my nieces um, at one of the skating trails. So use people from your community, particularly for newcomer groups. They need to be able to see themselves in the photos because if they don't, they're not going to try something. So I encourage you to, if you can, um, get some local photos, if not, have a look for some really great stock photos that are fun and show people of all ages and all backgrounds, you know, in those photos so that you get some really diverse photos. And then also when you're looking at winter events, use a GBA plus lens. That's that gender-based analysis plus. Um, if you're not sure what that means, basically it means looking at your city through different lenses and what barriers exist for different people. So for example, age. Do children have opportunities to play in the winter? You know, hopefully your play structures are still open all winter and not closed. And then what about seniors? Most of our seniors, let's face it, are healthy and active, but 
a side a pathway like this one on the right is an immediate barrier for seniors who are afraid of falling and slipping. Um, so, so what are your maintenance procedures? Do you need to clear more paths? How do they affect people of all ages and abilities? Right. If you have someone who's a wheelchair user, and I'll talk a bit about that more later, but even a parent with a stroller would have difficulty getting over that path. Um, ethnic origins. So most North American cities, we have people from very diverse backgrounds and countries. Immigrants who come from countries that have already have ice and snow are much more willing to go outside in the winter. However, if you've got populations that come from warmer countries, some of them are afraid of the cold. They don't know how to dress for it. They don't want to be outside. They just want to hibernate all winter and they shy away from it. So we need to provide opportunities for, for them to get outside. But what we have found in Edmonton is it's not just about working with, those, with um, newcomer groups uh, to provide free lessons, whether it's downhill skiing or cross country or snowshoe lessons, it doesn't matter what it is. It's not only a matter of those free lessons to introduce them to something, but often we've had to teach them how to dress. And maybe you might need to provide mittens. We've had to provide mittens to some people. You know, they'll turn up for ski lessons without snow pants. So when you're designing activities, events, programs for different groups, use use different lenses to think about what their needs might be. And some of them might surprise you. Like we really didn't consider that we would have to provide mittens and snow pants. Um, so, so just another lens to look through. Uh, income level is another one. Uh, lower income citizens tend to rely on public transit more, which means that they're standing at bus stops, they're exposed to the elements more. Do your bus stops have sh bus shelters where they can uh, get out of the wind? Are your festivals and your parks accessible by public transit? In our case in Edmonton, to be honest, we still are not good about that. Some of our major parks are not very accessible by public transit, which means that some of the festivals in the parks are not very accessible. Um, but the income level also affects clothing choices and what they can and can't afford. So if they can only afford a secondhand jacket or a discount jacket, they're not going to be spending as much time outside because they will get cold. So if you're, if you're trying to create spaces that are inviting and welcoming to everybody, if you know that you have a larger group of low income residents in that area, you may need to provide more warming spaces or just inside spaces for them to go in and warm up so they can spend some more time outside. Because let's face it, when we get cold, we do not want to be outside. And then ability and disability impact our mobility. And that can change at any time. We are all just temporarily abled. Um, that's actually me on the right. I had a stress fracture in my right foot a few winters ago, and it completely changed my experience of winter. And the young woman beside me is actually a coworker who, for a couple of reasons, suddenly found herself being a wheelchair user in her early 30s. And her experience of winter has changed completely. She can sometimes make it to the bus stop, but if the bus stop hasn't been cleared, she can't actually physically get on the bus. Um, so it's not just about accessibility, but it's it's also about dignity. You know, how can people move around in your city? And it's about equity. And I'm afraid I don't have answers for you. It's a it's a difficult question that we're still struggling with. But like the fellow on the right, as soon as he runs into something on the left there, his journey's over. He might only need to go another half a block, but he cannot get there. And that creates more social isolation, which is already a problem with COVID. It affects mental health. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, I don't really have many answers, except seeing if you can figure out what the needs are in your community and can you make it, can you make it better? Now, I was also asked to talk about some ideas that I'm hearing about from other winter cities. So actually, before this, Joyce had asked me about fire pits and uh, fire ordinances you have in some of your cities are fairly restrictive. So in Canadian cities, they're not universal. In Edmonton here, we have fire pits down in our parks that can be used by anybody at any time. We just take our own firewood and clean out the snow and we use the fire pits. 
Um, in Calgary, though, people had to, residents had to get a fire permit to use them. So what they've done this winter, and maybe it will work um, for your communities, is they've waived that, they've waived those permits for this winter. And they've put more fire pits into their parks and some of them are actually bookable. So you go online, you can book it for an hour, and the city is providing wood. What I've heard though, is that they are struggling with wood being stolen. People are taking it and taking it home and having a fire at home. Um, so, you know, they're, they're using COVID, they're seeing an opportunity to try something new. They're running into challenges. It doesn't mean that it's a failure. It just means maybe, you know, they can look at doing what we do and just, tell people that they have to take their own firewood. Um, but they are providing more opportunities for people to get outside in their parks and more fire opportunities. Eau Claire in Wisconsin was one of um, three American cities that took part in the Winter Mission Project, which was run by 880 cities out of Toronto. And it was, um, it was a project to create a winter strategy to combat is social isolation. So one of the things that um, Eau Claire did, and it was very successful last year, and they're continuing it this year, was they had a gear share. And they put gear into two of their like winter kits, into two of their libraries. So they already had that infrastructure, and they chose to use the library uh, infrastructure to get these snow kits out. So, you know, you can check out snowshoes, uh, sleds, or hockey gear, and, you know, broom ball sets. Um, and it was, it was very successful. And I think it's it's actually going to be adopted by another community. And at the, right now, I can't remember which one. Um, but maybe that will work in your area too. Uh, Toronto is clearing more trails this winter. They're opening washrooms in their parks. Um, in Edmonton, one of the things we found when we first started the Winter City Strategy was that a lot of our park infrastructure was built during our oil boom in the 70s but it was only built for summer use. So our, our washrooms get closed because the sewer lines are really shallow and freeze in the winter. So now with those winter design guidelines that we have, we also have a winter design policy and all new city infrastructure has to be built with a four season lens. So it can be used, and let's face it, it's the best return on investment. If you build a building, you want to be able to use it year round. So, but in Toronto, they have washrooms that they could open, but they had they were choosing to close them. So this winter, they're opening those washrooms. Um, like I said, they're clearing more trails, but they're also advertising. They're telling people what's available, what they can do. So how many ice rinks, how many snow loops and parks are open. So that speaks again to that promotion that I was talking about earlier on and how important it is. Uh, in some cities, some cities will allow snow piles to be left. Uh, if you can, I encourage you to leave them. Kids, kids will spend a couple of hours on a snow pile. It's cheap. You just have to put the snow together. Um, it may depend on your health regulations, um, but it's a really easy answer. And then kids will create slides out of them too. In this case, they actually dug a hole through it and created a little tunnel that they were sliding through before going down the slide. Now, if you don't have lots of snow, Another option is to make snow. So when we had that winter market, we hosted it um, a few years ago, the one I mentioned earlier. We didn't have enough snow to make a snow slide. We wanted to make it on the steps outside our city, this, well, in the square outside our city hall. So we worked with one of our uh, local ski hills to get a snow making machine down there. It took us about a week to get enough snow and then we carved this snow slide. We had an artist carve some designs in the side as well um, and we had a snow slide right in downtown and uh, New Bedford Massachusetts winter they're creating snow for their Winterfest activation so it can be done you just need to have cold enough temperatures at night for the snow guns to work and Bench Consulting um, ran a competition earlier this year it was a, a winter places uh, design competition and it was it was international and there's some really great ideas in there so I encourage you to go and have a look at this it's just been released very recently uh, and maybe there are some ideas in there for you 
And I'll finish with winter patios because they have become a really hot topic. So patios around the world were very popular this summer. It helped some restaurants survive. Um, but we've been working for the last seven years to change our story about patios. It used to be that patios were just a summer event and we're now encouraging a four season patio culture. So we do have some permanent winter patios around the city already, um, but we have a lot more venues trying it this winter, which is great. But my big advice for a winter patio is don't try to recreate a summer experience. You want a winter experience. People will not eat a meal sitting outside because the food will get cold. So you want to focus on hot drinks, on soup, maybe appetizers and desserts. But if you're talking to your local venues and your, your local restaurants, encourage them to try something new. It is a gamble for them um, and it, it can, be, there can be a challenge, but there can be a lot of reward as well. So this is a picture of our most established ones, our oldest and most established winter patio. Um, it's, it's also large because it's on public land, uh, or sorry, not on, it's on private, private space. Um, so they're, they're able to spread out more than just on a sidewalk. Um, but it doesn't have to be this, this, um, this big and this intricate. It can be as simple as putting out some picnic benches or some chairs and some tables. Um, the, the other thing I will say about heating, uh, and I, I understand it's fairly difficult to get patio heaters at the moment, um, but the, the tall patio heaters that we tend to think about are pretty useless in the winter time. As we all know, heat rises. And so those tall ones might heat the top of your head, but they're not going to keep the rest of you warm. So if you're, if you're talking to places that are looking for ideas, think about fire tables, something that will keep it low. Um, you want low heat, Some, like I mean low as in uh, close to the ground. Uh, you know, you'll have to work with your, uh, with your fire departments and so on to see what will work. Um, but we have a number of venues this winter that are using fire tables and they've just put chairs around them and uh, they're keeping people warmer. Uh, the other thing we used to do pre-COVID uh, was we would give very bright blankets to venues that were setting up a winter patio just to add some color and create that invitation for people to come in. Unfortunately, uh, with COVID, we can't do that, um, can't have blankets, but, you know, encourage people to take their own, you know, do a BYO blanket campaign. And then I'll finish with uh, this story. This is a venue. Um, in our downtown, and they uh, they started their winter patio a couple of winters ago, and we had the polar vortex sit over Edmonton last year. It's about minus 32 Celsius, which I think is about minus 27 Fahrenheit. Uh, it sat over us for about two and a half weeks, and somebody set, sent out on Twitter, they tagged um, the venue, the Rocky Mountain Ice House, and said, we think you should open your polar patio club tonight uh, just because. And the venue said, if you come, we'll open it. And so they ended up with about 30 people on the patio that night. The beer was slushy in the glasses by the end of the evening. Um, but these people now have bragging rights and they have a really fun story to tell. So my message is if you provide an opportunity for people to try something new and fun, they will often turn up. So I really encourage you to think outside the box this winter, and I hope that I've given you some ideas that will help in your communities. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a couple of questions that have already come in. So the first one, on the hot chocolate distribution, do you have a source for the backpack tanks you showed? Yes, uh, it's called the Keg Club. Um, and I can, Joyce, I can actually send you the, the link um, after this, uh, okay. but the company is called the Keg Club, and yeah, they are insulated backpacks, and um, then you will have to get the cup dispenser for the side and the hose. And I encourage you, if you order them, to order a couple of extra hoses and cup dispensers just in case one breaks. You have one, um, but they're they're a lot of fun. Yeah, people really enjoyed them. Great. Uh, the next question. 
interested in information for the large outdoor blocks and also the light up teeter-totters. Okay, so those teeter-totters were uh, out of Montreal. It was called, uh, just a second. Um, yeah, it was a, there is a cost to those. Um, we did pay to bring them in. They were, um, it's called Impulse Installation and Loop, I think. It was there, yeah, they were out of Montreal. Um, if And you just leased them. To, yeah, it, you know, if you can't find them, uh, email me and I'll see if I can find the information. We, the Winter City office didn't actually rent them. It was somebody else in the city, but I can try and find okay. that information if you can't find it. And sorry, what was the first question? Something about blocks? The very first, no, the, the first question was about the backpacks. Yeah, the second, yeah. oh, it was the outdoor blocks and the light up teeter-totter, yeah. Oh, okay, so those big kind of Lego Duplo blocks. Um, that's another group in the city that had those. I can find the information and Joyce, I can send that to you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, someone wrote, I signed on late. Will this webinar be recorded and watched later? Yes, so everyone who attends and everyone who doesn't attend will receive a link to the recording of this webinar. Okay, Lindsay says, thanks for presenting this. Great information, thanks so much. Can you elaborate more on the play streets? Yes, um, so play streets are basically when you close down a block and you have lots of fun stuff um, for people to do. Uh, there are play streets and there are open streets. Um, open streets tend to be a bigger event. Play streets we have um, in the city, we have play street kits uh, that some of our communities can, can sign out. And basically they are traffic cones and um, barricades. And I think they have balls in them and they have like a, a tug of rope, um, yeah, uh, you know, like some some outdoor games that um, we have a what's called a community league system here, a bit like I think you have community associations, so it's similar. So those groups can sign them out and decide to block off. So they work with we have what are called neighborhood recreation coordinators. Uh, they work with them to get the permit to block the street, and then they sign out these kits, and it's just. They can have a block, they can have hockey, um, they can play soccer, they can do whatever they want on those play streets. And it just gives the kids a chance to just play on the street. So are th that's done in residential neighborhoods as well yes. as commercial districts? That's right, yeah. yeah. Most of the play streets are in residential areas. Uh, the one that we did did happen to be in our downtown, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, how many restaurants have outside winter patios and have local businesses seen an increase in business since the winter city was adopted? Right, so this winter, I just heard the other day that we have about 35 uh, winter patios. Um, and, uh, sorry, read the, read the question. Are they seeing more business? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, have they seen an increase in business because of uh, winter city? Yes, I, I think they have. So we held, when we were first um, trying to encourage winter patios, we started with what we call the shoulder season. So the spring and the fall. The first year we did one in the spring and we held a farewell to winter patio party. And we had, I think, over 70 venues sign up that year. And all they had to do was agree to open their patio early. Um, and we would provide blankets and all the marketing and so on for it. Um, what they found was that the south-facing patios worked really well. People would sit on them because they were in the sun. Some of the west-facing ones worked pretty well as well because they got the afternoon sun. The north-facing patios really didn't have a lot of business, and the east-facing patios were the same. But what they did tell us was just by putting their chairs out and putting colorful blankets out, it created an invitation. So they... Some of them, particularly those north facing ones, didn't necessarily have more people sitting on the patios, but they had more business that weekend. So even just having a patio, putting out a few tables and chairs creates an invitation. So I, you know, I would encourage venues to try it. Um, it does mean teaching staff how to go in and out, um, maybe being a little flexible if they have a uniform, 
maybe provide them with a toque, um, sorry, a, a woolen cap, I think you call it. There's a good Canadian word for you, is a toque. Um, you know, or provide them with a vest. Um, we suggest leather gloves, not, not woolen gloves because they're slippery, whereas leather will help grab the plates better or the cups. Um, but if they're just going in and out, they maybe don't need mitts or they can have those fingerless gloves. Um, so there is some training with the staff as well, um, but they have, you know, they have seen more business and particularly during COVID, people are much more willing to sit outside than go inside. Yes. Uh, another question about, do you have fire table recommendations? Uh, not specifically. Um, I just know that some venues are using them and there are many different styles. Uh, yeah, I would just have a look and see what's available. And I think there may even be very little choice <laughs> at this <laughs> point. Um, the, you know, all those heaters are really popular right now. So just grab what you can. Um, but, you know, like the, the coffee table height ones are, are good. They're, they'll keep people warmer uh, than, the, than the taller ones. Great. How do you do the residential design competition? Is there a place to get more information about that? The residential design, do they mean the, like the- I think the outdoor yard displays. Oh, okay, yeah. We just, we call it Winterscapes. Um, it's, there's information on the, the website, the wintercityedmonton.ca website. It has a Winterscapes section. There's also more information on the City of Edmonton website. But basically what we do is um, we just advertise and people take a photo and they send it in and then we choose one at random for a weekly draw and then at the end we have we choose you know we choose the top three that we like um you know it's it's not um it's not a very robust system i guess you know but it's it just gets gets people outside and it 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 makes the neighborhoods nicer to go through particularly see we run it in january and february once all the Christmas lights are down, um, we we actually encourage people to keep those lights up. We call them winter lights or sometimes holiday lights. But we we really started pushing the term winter lights. You know, put your lights on in November after Remembrance Day, which for you I think is Veterans Day, and then keep them on until March because January and February are dark for us and December. Like, but we already have lots of stuff in December, so it's at January, February, beginning of March. That's when we really push, keep your lights on, decorate your yards. Um, it's mainly a social media campaign, really. Okay, we have another question about the regular shops in the winter city concept. How does that help retail shopping and do the shops stay open longer hours, particularly with it getting dark so early? How does, how does winter city affect retail uh, shopping? Um, I think with the big box stores, I don't honestly think we make much difference, but we have some older uh, kind of business improvement areas. Um, and because of, because of Winter City, they're, they're now decorating their streets differently. They have more lights up. Um, I don't think they stay open any later. Um, I mean, we're used to the dark in the winter and I mean, we're not, we're actually not that far north. We're, we are in North American terms, but in European terms, we're actually the same as like Manchester and Berlin. So oh. um, we're, everything's relative, right? <laughs> um, so we don't, yeah, um, we just know that it gets dark by four, by 3.30 or four, and people still go out. But there, there is more what we call tree wrapping going on. You know, they, they have lights strung um, in the trees along certain kind of pedestrian, friendly shopping areas. Um, they put out planters now that they keep out year round, just to, they, they make their space more comfortable and more inviting to be in. Again, it's about creating that invitation for people to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah all of those planning concepts are good for mm -hmm. year round. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So we have a little lull in the questions, please don't be shy, <laughs> type in a question. Uh, Heritage Ohio's next webinar will be December 16th at 1 p.m. with Mary Angela Feaster on using the Secretary of Interior standards on historic projects. Um, 
We're waiting for just oh, here's a, a long question came in just a second. Okay. Are there any resources you can suggest that may have data on benefits of more activity in and around downtown areas, neighborhoods, public benefits, economic impact, health benefits? I'm looking for information to share with local elected officials to try to get support for funding. Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, you haven't done an economic impact study on Winter City, or we've we've done a little bit. So we did. Uh, it's it's on our on the main city of Edmonton website. It's called. We did a, a kind of a mid strategy evaluation and report. Uh, sorry, uh, we did a mid strategy um, evaluation and report in 2018 called "Keep the Snowball Rolling," and it has um, some. Some data now. Some of it's not, you know, there. It it wasn't really robust uh, data, but it's there's some qualitative and some quantitative data in there. Um, a lot of anecdotal things as well, which may or may not be helpful. Um, but I can, Joyce, I can send you the link to that as well. Um, sure. Maybe that will be helpful. Uh, Otherwise, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but if I do think of something, then I will yeah. I will let you know. Yeah. But I, I assume that your um, your city council has been convinced that this investment is worth pursuing and that there haven't been doubters or are they all in? Uh, yeah, they've been they've been mostly um, supportive. It was a 10 year strategy and we were given a budget for 10 years. Um, oh. What happens with our um election next year we'll see but we've um this is year eight we've completed seven years so we're into year eight so we're getting close um but what we're hearing particularly from our festivals and um yeah some of the business improvement areas is don't stop we're making changes we're seeing a difference but if we take our foot off the accelerator now we'll lose all of that momentum um so so I mean we are we are seeing but it's you know like I said, we've been doing this for seven years so it's sometimes it feels like nothing's happening and then suddenly there's a change right <laughs> and it's it's really hard to to get data on social change it's yeah. it's very difficult yeah. yeah had another question about the presentation it is available there on the control panel on the right side of your screen you should have a control panel and there's a couple of gray bars and one of them is called handouts and the powerpoint is there as a handout so that you can download that another question came in if just in the planning phase what is the best type of material for walk walking pathways in parks so snow and ice easily can be cleared off uh i don't know we've we've toyed with a couple of different like different salts and treatments um it would really depend what your environmental laws are uh like a paved pathway is much easier to clear right um it also makes it more accessible if it's paved it makes it more accessible for anybody with any kind of mobility issue um, and you would want it to be wide enough for, say, two wheelchairs to pass each other comfortably. Uh, but that's all the universal design um, standards. Uh, Do you have any preferences over concrete, over asphalt, or anything like that? You know what? I, I honestly don't know. I think we've okay. got a lot of asphalt in our parks. I think that's what it mostly is. And it seems to hold up okay. But I mean, it also depends on your freeze thaw cycle. You know, yeah. we didn't used to have a lot of freeze thaw, and the last few winters we've had a lot of freeze thaw cycles. Uh, so that's a change to our winter. Um, and yeah, it's creating different challenges for us. Um, so yeah, you would have to see what your context is, what your temperatures are, your freeze thaw cycles, and then see what would be the best material for your area. Sorry, I can't be any more specific. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. And I, I, I suspect the keep the snowball rolling. I bet if you Google it, that report might come up on the city yes, site. Yes, it, it probably yeah. does. Yeah, but I'll, yeah. I'll, Joyce, I'll send you the link just in okay. case. Um, thank, we, we, we've gone past our hour. It's been great information. We're all, we're all looking for uh, solutions and ideas for this uh, 
this winter and every winter into the future. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Isla. I so much appreciate you uh, with your generosity and expertise in preparing this webinar for us. And thank you very much. And we'll My see pleasure. you all later. Great. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. So do I just